The opinions and suggestions expressed on the following program are solely those of the participants and not necessarily endorsed by program sponsors or any radio station, media company, or platform broadcasting this program. The following program is a product of Causeway LLC. The information in this broadcast is not intended as investment, tax, or financial advice. Matthew Moore is not a licensed investment advisor and speaks solely from his experience and opinions. All information in this broadcast is for entertainment or educational purposes only. Matthew Moore, Causeway LLC, and the company or platform broadcasting this program is not responsible for the success or failure of any person's investment decisions or purchases. Matthew Moore, Causeway LLC, and the company or platform broadcasting this program makes no and expressly disclaims all representations, warranties, and guarantees with respect to this broadcast and its sponsors. Investing in any market is inherently risky and can be financially dangerous. Invest at your own risk. Coming. Government officials we will continue to as this story unfolds. Welcome to Cryptocurrency with Matthew J. Moore, the Bitcoin-focused radio show that's waking the masses to the fiat money Ponzi scheme. Money is changing and your freedom is at stake. So stick around and learn how to empower yourself for this new digital age. Now, here's your host, Matthew J. Moore. Welcome, America, and welcome, planet Earth. That's right, it's the right time, and you're at the right place. No matter where you are, what you're doing, who you are, I want to welcome every single one of you Bitcoin lovers, newbies, and maybe even experts, because we do have uh, people listening from all over the globe, not just the cities we broadcast in. But you're now listening to Cryptocurrency with Matthew J. Moore. Yes, that is me. And uh, if you were wondering, yes. Absolutely. We are America's Bitcoin-focused radio show. It's a place where you're going to learn about money and freedom and history and technology and this thing called Bitcoin mining and the things that go along with it. I mean, there's a lot of things we cover on this show, and hopefully we kind of unpack it and put it in layman's terms so you can understand this new and evolving space called Bitcoin. But here's the topic I want to talk about today. You know, we're... When you, when you look at Bitcoin and you look at the space at large, there's individuals, there's companies, there's movers and there's shakers. But the greatest movers of the Bitcoin space, in my opinion, are no doubt the companies who bring value to Bitcoin and its network. And that's going to continue to happen. And the products and services that are being developed around Bitcoin and its decentralized network are Absolutely amazing, Amazing, in my opinion. Uh, we are in some real pioneering days, and uh, every year it just seems to get better and better. And that's why I'm so excited about Bitcoin and what the future holds. And, and one of those companies changing the game and adding true value is Luxor Technology. And on today's episode, we're going to take a look under the hood, hopefully, of this company called Luxor. And, uh, you know, the impact that they've had on Bitcoin and its ecosystem. And uh, so we're gonna have a fun conversation with uh, the CEO. But before I do, I need to give a shout out to my producer, Brian LaRue. If you were listening to this show and you heard that awesome intro, or maybe you'll hear our outros or our commercials, or maybe you just like the sound of the program. Well, he knows how to mix, he knows how to master, he knows how to create awesome sounding uh, tracks and music beds. And so if you've got something like that, maybe you want to create a podcast, a radio show, maybe you're a musician, reach out to Brian at beyondyouproductions.com. He does a phenomenal job. And I always want to push his work because he has truly been a blessing to this show. But today on the line, we have the CEO, like I was saying, the CEO of Luxor Technology. Uh, his name is Nick Hansen. And uh, Nick, I know you're on the line here, but for our listeners who might be unfamiliar with who you are or what you do, uh, please introduce yourself in your own words and uh, maybe share a little bit about what you're doing. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Uh, first time I've been on real radio. So this is cool. I appreciate you having me. Uh, my name is Nick Hansen. Uh, I am the CEO of Luxor Technology. Uh, previous to building Luxor, I was a lead member of technical staff at Salesforce, uh, working on Einstein, effectively Alexa for Salesforce. Uh, so I have a deep technical software engineering background. I like to say that I'm a software engineer by trade and a CEO in training. Uh, Luxor is a team of around 60 now, just under just under 60. Um, so had to really level up those CEO skills. Um, but my background is is deeply uh, technical. And so we can dig into any of the technical aspects of Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, um, this new thing called ordinals, um, you know, firmware, which is the software that goes on the mining machines themselves. 
Um, all of those things are things that we we uh, build products for and have uh, deep expertise in. Um, and again, yeah, just very happy to be on the show and happy to answer some questions and, and talk about this stuff with you. Well, Nick, uh, rumor has it that you're doing a great job. So keep it up, man. And even if it feels like you're swimming and you're having to dive deep into those CEO, uh, that CEO realm, I, I, I feel you, brother. Um, but hey, let's let's do this. Uh, I, I typically love to get a little bit of background information to get, uh, you know, build some perspective, some history, context for people who are listening to this show. Uh, I like to hear people's orange pill story. So I really want to kick off the show with your story. How did you stumble upon Bitcoin? Yeah. So, uh, you know, when Bitcoin was coming out, I was in college kind of, or when it coming out, when Bitcoin was kind of starting to be talked about, I was still in college. Um, you know, right after I graduated, I got into Bitcoin mining. That was uh, how I started getting into Bitcoin. Uh, but Bitcoin mining looked very different then. You know, you we were putting together GPUs. Uh, and so I was always really interested in like building computers, things like that, sort of a hobby of mine. And was like, wait, you can put five GPUs inside of a, of a computer and, you know, generate this internet money with it. Uh, didn't really understand all of the technical details at that point. Um, you know, this would have been around 2013 or 14, uh, back when you could mine Bitcoin with GPUs. And it was actually right around the time that ASICs started coming. ASICs are uh, computers. They're basically like servers specifically for Bitcoin mining. They have very uh, specific chips in them. That's what ASIC stands for, Application Specific Integrated Circuit. Um, and we just, you know, we just uh, colloquially uh, refer to Bitcoin miners as ASICs now. Um, and so that was kind of how I got into the world of, crypt of, the world of cryptocurrency at, at, at large. Uh, at that time, you know, there was really only Bitcoin and a few other coins that were basically forts of Bitcoin at the time. So Litecoin came along uh, right after Bitcoin. Bitcoin, uh, so Litecoin was a, a coin that came basically trying to reduce the ASIC ability of, a, of, a, of, a, of Bitcoin. So making it more GPU friendly, uh, because everybody had invested all of their money into building, um, you know, building out GPU miners. Uh, and so if these ASICs were coming in that were a hundred times more efficient, all of the folks that had GPU miners were like, oh, they're pretty much screwed. So, uh, started getting into Litecoin mining because I had GPUs, didn't have ASICs early on. ASICs were very hard to get. Um, it's very kind of wild west out there. Nobody knew if uh, if I send this guy ten thousand dollars, am I going to get anything in the mail uh, in return for those ASICs? The first uh, real ASIC manufacturer was called Butterfly Labs, and that was the case. You know, most of the folks that uh, went and purchased Butterfly Labs machines never got them, and so. It was the Wild West. Uh, and so we were doing all this GPU mining and, and trying to figure out what this cryptocurrency thing was. And that was my original orange pill. Um, that was, you know, back when Bitcoin was 80 to to $100 or maybe even less than that. Um, you know, Litecoin was somewhere around like $0.05 cents or $0.50. Cent. You know, between 50 you know, everything was very volatile. So that was really the, the, the place where I got started. Um, didn't really have the skills. I was too early in my career to really have skills to build any sort of meaningful business around this. Um, and so at the time I was working for Salesforce and was getting, you know, all of this engineering, uh, you know, expertise, I guess, from, from just being ingrained into an engineering team for four or five years. And then around 2017 started, you know, looking at what are some of the types of products that I could build with the skill set that I've learned working in, you know, corporate engineering world. And that was kind of where the mining pool came from. Um, actually, early on, we weren't even looking to build a mining pool. We were looking to build a something like uh, a S3, which is a place where you would store like files. We were thinking about storing files on um, the blockchain. And, you know, of course, that didn't work. Um, so we went into Bitcoin mining. And so that's how I kind of got into where we're at today. Okay, well, did that so that led to the creation, I would assume, of your company, Luxor Technology. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, was working on this uh, web storage platform. We were going to call it Sia Three, and basically trying to put a um, a web wrapper, a web wrapper around the blockchain, so you could put files onto the blockchain. Um, and I met my co original co founder Eddie through GitHub. GitHub is a place where uh, coders store their their uh, their code, um, and you know he found my 
the code that I was working on was like, hey, this is really cool. We should like work together on this. And uh, after working together for a few months, we're like, hey, we should probably like build, put a company around this because we don't really know what's going to happen here. And so that was what caused the inception of Luxor at the time. We didn't really have these grand plans of building what Luxor is today. Uh, it was really mostly just a hobby nights and weekends project. We're like, oh, maybe we can make an extra few thousand dollars a month or something um, by offering these services. And now we're, you know, off to off to the races, you know, for what is it, almost five years later. Well, um, you know, just really. Yeah, no, I, I I love it, and I think one of the you know the we'll, we'll jump into the mining pool discussion here in a minute, but uh, the the thing that I've heard the most from Luxor is your your firmware. Can you talk a little bit about you know the firmware and how that's been advancing uh, the Bitcoin space yeah. at large? Yeah, so so firmware is the software that runs on mining machines, and we like I like to liken it very similar to how we used to jailbreak our iPhone. So you would you know your iPhone phenomenal platform. Uh, but there's maybe a few features in there that you could unlock uh, using, you know, basically by jailbreaking your iPhone. Um, we have a very similar uh, situation in Bitcoin mining. There's a lot of features inside of these mining machines that you can unlock if you're able to jailbreak them. So we basically build what we call, um, you know, we, we, we break in, you know, kind of break into them, reverse engineer them and get our firmware onto the machines. Once it's on the machines, we're able to do all sorts of really cool things. Most of what we try to build, most of what we're doing now is, is building tooling for what's called demand response or controllable load resourcing. There are software platforms out there that basically look at the state of the electrical grid that you're operating your Bitcoin mine in and balance the grid based on different conditions, based on how much demand there is, uh, how much supply there is, uh, frequency response, that sort of thing. Uh, and so we're building a platform inside of these mining machines that allows those software systems to integrate more directly with the Bitcoin miners and turn them on and off very, very quickly. Basically, what we're trying to do is figure out how to turn machines on and off very, very quickly, um, you know, within a second or so. So that way they are uh, very dynamic and able to respond to the grid. So that's what we're trying to build and what we the the uh, the product is called Lux OS and that you know Luxor operating system and it goes on the mining machine and that's what we're trying to build is this like demand response that's really the place that we're focusing a lot of our time and effort in. So we I guess uh, oh sorry a, a little side tangent on uh, that feature set is something we call advanced thermal management in the summers here uh, it's very hot and mining machines are basically heaters they produce a lot of heat. And so we built uh, also systems to uh, monitor that heat and reduce heat if the ambient temperatures increase significantly as well. So when we talk about that, that demand process in mining, is, does this fall into the whole idea of mining economics? What does that what does that look like for both your company and a miner? Is this am I correct in saying that? Yeah. So we're we're very closely integrated with that. Though we don't, you know, we're not the ones defining the mining economics it really depends on where the mining company is located say uh you're in texas that's a pretty much the hot the, or the the most popular place to mine in, in bitcoin in the united states right now they have a very robust grid they also have a very uh lucrative demand response program in ERCOT. ERCOT is the name of the grid in texas and so that's where most of the biggest miners are so like if you go google you know biggest Bitcoin miner in the United States, you'll find like Riot Platforms, uh, Marathon Digital. Um, there's a private company called Cormint that are all in Texas and they're very active in the energy markets. So they're taking data from platforms like, you know, Lancium and Voltus and, and using that data to inform the decisions that they make inside of their mind about whether it's profitable to mine at a point in time or not. Okay. Well, so. All right. So, you know, when we talk about Bitcoin mining and the economics and we talk about the strength of the network, a lot of time you hear things like hash hash rate and uh, uh, hash power, I guess. And But you've got this thing called, uh, or is it hash rate index that you guys are doing here? Uh, explain to the listeners uh, what, what that is. And, you know, this is like a research part of your business, I guess. Yeah. So hash rate index is supposed to be an informative site that we use to help people make informed decisions about uh, investing in mining, how to approach the market, um, make educated uh, debt decisions on 
what the environment is in, in Bitcoin mining right now. So one of the, the very first metric that we started to expose was this concept called hash price. Um, we, we call it, we, it hash price is the value of the output of your mining machine, the output of your mining machine being hash rate. Uh, we call that the value of your hash rate over time. So it changes all the time based on different things. Um, there's three major parameters that go into hash price. One is the network difficulty. Um, the, the difficulty to mine Bitcoin increases as there are more miners on the network. So if you imagine there's a million machines on the network, uh, you all get some portion of the reward. Um, if it goes to two million, uh, it be, you, you know, basically the, your reward goes down by half because there's now twice as much competition. So that's one of the parameters that goes into the hash price calculation. The other is the USD price of Bitcoin. Um, you know, Bitcoin is very volatile, changes very, you know, can change drastically day to day. Uh, actually, it's significantly less volatile now than it has been in a long time, though. So that is uh, that is an interesting point. Uh, and then the last one, which is not as interesting, but it has become very interesting with the uh, advent of ordinals and inscriptions, is the transaction fee component. So whenever you send Bitcoin, uh, you actually pay some small portion uh, to the miners to, uh, in, you know, to compensate them for doing the validation and the work that is necessary to include them into the Bitcoin blockchain. Well, ordinals and inscriptions cause the transaction fee portion to skyrocket, actually being more than the actual subsidy. So <clears throat> those are the three components that go into hash price. And we wanted to take those components uh, and display them very simply. And that's really what caused us to build hash rate index was just this idea that we wanted to display hash, hash price over time. And since hash rate index has turned into our basically our research arm. We go and research, you know, uh, the public miners, uh, determine you know, which miners being the most efficient with their capital or which miner produces the most Bitcoin. We do quarterly reports. Um, we have a premium version as well as a, a, a paid, uh, sorry, a, a free version. Um, you know, the premium version just being a little bit more in depth and including, you know, more granular data points. And, you know, a lot of the folks that use the premium are folks that are making uh, very you know big decisions financially about where to allocate their capital in this new and emerging market. So that's really the purpose of hash rate index and kind of how we got to where we are today with hash rate index. Uh, it's just a website hashrateindex.com. Okay, well, we, we got roughly about 30 seconds or so, but I wanted to just real quickly ask you, and I, I don't want to give any you know credit necessarily to your uh, competitors if there are any, but uh, I know the miners got to love what you guys do. Is there anybody else doing what you guys are doing right now? Yeah, so the biggest competitors that we have right now would be Foundry on the mining pool side. Uh, there are two firmware competitors, one called Vanish and one called Brains OS. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's pools all over the world, uh, that we compete with, but generally we, we think of foundries being our biggest competitor. Okay. I well, love it. I love it. Well, um, if you're listening to this show, I, gosh, I want you to stick around, uh, because we got a lot more to cover. I got more great questions to, to ask Nick and, uh, what his company Luxury is up to, because they're up to a lot of great things. As you can tell, they're doing a lot of different things as well. That's conducive to the, the, the mining space. Um, but Hey, if you want to call up a friend, have them tune in, you know, and if you're listening on line leave a comment subscribe like you know if you are like hey i don't understand what is being talked about here don't worry this is a big topic to unpack but uh, there's you know this bitcoin's about learning it's about a, it's, a, it's a journey okay i've been in this space for gosh what six seven years now and i'm still learning every day is a new day so don't be discouraged if we're talking over your head you can always check out more at mattjmore.com and uh, we will be right back we've got to go to break uh but we're gonna have more great conversation with nick from Luxor. Stay put, my friends. Do you have Medicare and do you use a CPAP machine? This is a national health care alert regarding your CPAP supplies. Using a clean CPAP mask and clean supplies is important to staying healthy. The best way to make sure your CPAP equipment is clean is to get new supplies. If you have Medicare, we have great news. Medicare will pay for you to have new clean supplies every 90 days. We'll even do all the paperwork for you to make sure that there's little to no out-of-pocket cost to you. And you don't even have to leave your home. 
we provide free in-home delivery. So if you're a CPAP user and you have Medicare, staying healthy with new CPAP equipment is easy. Just make this free phone call right now to get started. Sponsored by Specialty Medical. 800-262-0318. What does it mean to be physically, spiritually, and financially free? The right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness, these were the ideas that made America. But what happens to these ideas when America's money becomes compromised? What do you do when the very thing that you're working for day after day is fundamentally designed to enslave you? Whether it was a conspiracy or not, you won't believe what is about to happen in this country. Arm yourself today with the truth and build your life on the foundations for liberty. Rediscover freedom in the 21st century and grab a copy of my Amazon best-selling book, Foundations for Liberty. For just $11.99, you can support this radio show by finding a copy on Amazon or by going to mattjmore.com. Again, that's mattjmore.com. Don't wait, because freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. In times of economic uncertainty and chaos, your money means nothing. You may not even be able to get it from your bank or ATM. And the money you do have in the stock market will go down and down. What you can bank on is gold and silver. Gold and silver have been a reliable and trusted form of currency for thousands of years. Gold and silver have never been worth zero, and typically gold holds its value during economic turmoil. Call the gold hotline now and learn how to protect your money and your assets with gold and silver. And learn how to set up a new IRA or roll over your current one into a gold-backed IRA. Protect your money from the next market crash with gold and silver. Call now for your free gold guide. 800-795-3441. 800-795-3441. 800-795-3441. And we are back, America. That's right. Ding, ding, ding. It is round two of America's Bitcoin-focused radio show. And uh, man, whether you're in your car at home just tuning in, maybe you're a Bitcoin lover. Maybe you're a newbie to all this. Maybe you know more than me. And hey, anything is possible. I'm always learning. I'm always in the classroom. This space is always evolving. I'm always surprised, honestly. This whole thing with uh, ordinals and inscriptions, just kind of hit me out of nowhere earlier this year in 2023. Uh, so I've been still learning about that. But I, I want to welcome all the haters, too. If you if you were skeptic about Bitcoin, skeptic about this space, you know, as time goes on, you're going to be in the minority, uh, just so it seems anyways, because uh, Bitcoin, in my opinion, is inevitable. But I still welcome you. And if you want to, you know, write me a nasty email, type it out, you know, keyboard warrior style. Hey, by all means, send it my way. I'd love to hear your feedback. I'd love to read what you have to say. Because, hey, maybe we, we maybe it'll give me an idea to talk about some special thing that maybe will just make that light bulb click for you. But I want to just go ahead and reiterate. Today, we've had a, a, we have a wonderful guest on today, and we're talking about his company. We're talking about his contributions to the Bitcoin space at large. And I've just mentioned in the first segment that really the people and, and entities that are moving this space forward and really adding value to the Bitcoin network um, are people like my guest today, like his company, Luxor. Um, And uh, there's no doubt that the products and services that are being developed around Bitcoin and its decentralized network, you know, it's it's changing the world. I mean, Bitcoin has already changed the world. It's going to continue to change the world. But every year, it just keeps getting better and better, in my opinion. So uh, on today's episode, like I mentioned earlier, we're taking a look under the hood. Hopefully, we'll continue to unpack what Luxor Technology does, and in their CEO, Nick Hansen, uh, what he has brought to the table for us today. And, uh, and I'm going to ask him a bunch of questions. But uh, Nick, I, you know, I know this is radio here. I know we're, we're, we're doing segment two. Uh, the fun thing is, unlike podcasts, you never know when people are tuning in. You never know when they're jumping in their car or maybe they just turned on the radio. So for those who uh, you know, are just now listening, just now tuning in, please just real quickly share a little bit of information about who you are and what you do. Yeah, I'm 
Appreciate it. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the, the second intro. My name is Nick Hansen. I'm the CEO of Luxor. Uh, if you go Google Luxor, most likely you'll find something about Bitcoin mining pools. Uh, that's what we're known for. That's kind of our flagship product. But we build all sorts of stuff. We build firmware, which is the software that goes on the machine. We also build derivatives products, which are like uh, kind of like when you hedge corn. We offer products very similar to that, but for Bitcoin miners. Uh, we also have a marketplace we call Luxor RFQ, where you buy and sell mining machines. Um, and then we also have all sorts of, you know, we, we have hash rate index, which is our um, you know, data platform for people to go learn about Bitcoin mining and make educated investing decisions. These are some of the products that we build. Uh, and that's a little bit about who I am. That's like my deep DNA is just being in Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining uh, and all things uh, related to that. OK, well, we've talked about mining pools a couple of times on past episodes, but uh, let's dive into mining pools. It's a big part of your business here. Uh, for those who are new, explain what a mining pool is and how they relate to Bitcoin and your company's work. Yeah, so a Bitcoin mining pool, actually Bitcoin mining, the process of mining is, is uh, mathematically equivalent to guessing lottery numbers. Uh, and hoping that you get the right one. If you get the right one, you win the lottery. Or in this case, you win you know, a block of Bitcoin, which is 6.25 Bitcoin right now, about $180,000. So when the, the way that you improve your odds of guessing these numbers is just to guess faster. And so you either add more machines or get more powerful machines uh, in this analogy. And then that's and what our pool is doing and basically what all Bitcoin mining pools are doing is what we call work de work delegation. We're making sure that you're not working on the same set of numbers. So if you and I were working together to find a block of Bitcoin, um, you know, I'd make sure that you're guessing, you know, numbers one through a thousand and I'm working on a thousand to two thousand. That's what a Bitcoin mining pool does. The reason you need a Bitcoin mining pool is if you imagine having millions and millions of mining machines in the world competing for one uh, block of Bitcoin. The odds of any individual machine getting it are incredibly low. So you uh, you aggregate, you pool your your mining power together, and then you share in the reward uh, when the block is won. So that's how a Bitcoin mining pool very very basically works. And uh, so that's what we've been doing. Um, you know, it's very important for us to verify that you know we're not we don't have miners guessing the same numbers because then you're uh, effectively uh, wasting you know the the mining power. And so that's what we do. And that's what a mining pool does. And when you Google, you know, Bitcoin mining pools, all the ones that you see, you've got Luxor and Foundry and Brains and F2 pool and Via BTC and Ant pool, all those all those pools, they're effectively doing the same thing. And that's what we're doing as well. And the firmware that you offer is also helping with the efficiency of that guesswork, correct? Yeah. So, you know, when you're if you're, if anybody's familiar with the term overclocking, basically the 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 CPU, the the piece of compute hardware inside of your device can go at a certain speed. Um, basically, they pick a, they pick one that's very you know efficient. It keeps the chips cool. Um, but what we can do, what you can do is you can increase that that speed or decrease it based on you know whatever criteria you have. And that's what we're doing with our firmware is basically reducing the clock speed or increasing the clock speed so that you're either guessing numbers faster uh, but your chips are hotter or you're guessing slower, but your chips are running cooler. Um, and the reason, you know, you need to have this level of granularity is because the conditions on the network or the conditions where your mining machines are are connected um, can change drastically. You know, it's it's a much different, you know, much different in West Texas than, say, northern Canada right now. Um, and so you would have to modulate the speed at which you're able to mine with a particular Bitcoin mining machine. And that's what our firmware is actually exposing is the ability to to change those clock speeds based on whatever the conditions are for the machine that you're operating. So let me ask you this, as, as Bitcoin network grows and uh, the difficulty adjustment happens and, you know, we've got you know, do, do we maintain and incentivize decentralization with mining pools? I mean, how do we get more full nodes online? How do we make sure that, uh, you know, Bitcoin operates in a decentralized manner for those who may not understand? Yeah. So the good thing about Bitcoin mining is that it's ultimately powered by energy. Energy is sparse, meaning there's generally the same amount of energy hits every surface of the planet. Uh, somewhat equally, if you average it out over a long period of time. Um, the reason for that is the sun is our source of energy. The sun hits and it we capture that energy in a multitude of different ways, whether that's, you know, through water evaporation and producing, um, you know, 
rain, which is then hydropower. Uh, you've obviously got solar. Um, that energy can be trapped in biomass, turning into petroleum products you know, over tens of thousands of years. Um, those are all ways in which energy is trapped on the surface of the planet and then can be consumed by Bitcoin miners. So inherently, Bitcoin is going to be very decentralized because of the sparseness of, of, of energy. <clears throat> I should say Bitcoin mining. And at the end of the day, Bitcoin mining needs to remain as decentralized as possible. And it actually is right now as decentralized as it's ever been. Um, just because of how much competition there is uh, around the world for this this energy. Um, and I think we continue to see that. Uh, of course, there are places where energy right now is maybe a little bit more readily available. You look at places like Texas, you look at places like the Middle East. Um, those places have energy that's re very readily available in the form of petroleum products, um, also sun, uh, you know, solar wind type of, of, of activity. Um, and that's where Bitcoin mining is being done now, but that doesn't mean it's going to be that way forever. So are we, in, I mean, in your, your opinion here, are we at the, are we kind of like past the point of no return? Like many Bitcoiners feel like Bitcoin is going to be inevitable. Uh, do you share this sentiment and why or why not? Yeah. So in my opinion, Bitcoin in, in its current state will, will never die. It's almost turned into this like pseudo living thing. Um, the reason for that is that as long as there is one computer running Bitcoin, then Bitcoin will continue to operate. Um, as long as there's one person mining Bitcoin, Bitcoin will continue to operate. And we've gotten to the point now where there's millions, if not tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of users of Bitcoin running uh, their Bitcoin infrastructure, running their Bitcoin core nodes, all of those things in every part of the world. And so at this point, it's sort of this like living thing. So even if you know, I turn off all of the Bitcoin nodes that I have running at my house or in our data in our data centers. Um, doesn't affect the network at all. Yeah. So I think we've reached this point of inevitability where Bitcoin is never not going to exist ever again. It may take different forms, or it may you know there may be government issues at some point down the line. But at this point, Bitcoin is here to stay. It will never go away. So earlier earlier this year, uh, I was uh, you know messing around with Bitcoin and transactions, right? You know, I, I always do it. You know, I'm I'm passionate about the space, but I noticed like transaction fees were like really high at the time, and it caused me to you know like what what is this ordinal thing all about? What's this inscription thing all about? Is this why the you know transaction fees are so high? Uh, what what's your? I mean, we had Charlie Spears on to talk about ordinals to kind of explain it to us. Uh, did some comparisons, but I'd love to hear your take on ordinals and inscriptions and can you kind of describe this new trend in bitcoin yeah so ordinals and inscriptions are basically nfts on bitcoin nfts have been around for a long long time um you know they you know, most people when you think of nfts you think of OpenSea and ethereum you know some of the collections being like crypto punks or board ape yacht club um, or, you know, all of these different, you know, NFTs, but now there's NFTs on Bitcoin. Um, ordinals are actually individual Satoshis. The a Satoshi is the smallest unit of account on Bitcoin. Uh, and an inscription is basically the data, the, the, the image or whatever it is that you're putting, which is then attributed to the ordinal. And so when we're trading inscriptions, what we're actually doing is moving around the ownership of a particular Satoshi. So if you wanted to, you know, say I minted some piece of art that you thought was awesome, um, the way that I would transfer that to you and you wanted to buy it from me is I would send you the Satoshi that it's attached to. And so that has caused a lot of transaction fee volume because now there's a, another, another activity on the chain that's occurring that's causing all of this extra transaction fee volume. And, and as more transactions occur, naturally transaction fees start to rise. And so that's why you're started to see uh, a lot of transaction fee uh, or the transaction fees start to increase um, is just through the natural market forces of people starting to interact with the chain, utilize the, you know, the, the finite Bitcoin block space that exists and, you know, really start to compete for that with their transaction fees. Okay, so why? I mean, maybe you maybe you know this answer, maybe you don't. Uh, you know, a lot of people out there who listen to this show and beyond probably know what a satoshi is if they're familiar with Bitcoin, the smaller unit of a Bitcoin, right? You know, the divisibility. Uh, but why not just say like, hey, we're putting inscriptions on individual satoshis? Like, what what what's with the word ordinal? 
Yeah, so it just it just happened to be so ordinals are a, a an ordinal is a number, um, and the reason we use the term ordinal is because we ordinal theory states that um, you know there will ever only be two point one quadrillion satoshis, uh, and each one of them you could assign a single number to, and so that's why we call them ordinals. Um, the first satoshi from the very first block. Uh, the one mine, you know, min, you know, the Genesis block minted by Satoshi Nakamoto uh, would be ordinal, ordinal number one. And then, of course, in 2140, uh, when the last Bitcoin is mined, that would be ordinal inscription, or ordinal number 2.1 quadrillion. Uh, and now, you know, they're all in, in, in every number in between one and 2.1 quadrillion. So that's why we came up with the idea. Uh, that's why the number uh, the numbering scheme is called ordinals. And that was um Coined by Casey uh, Casey Rodimore, who's kind of the the ordinal the concept of ordinals and inscriptions is is sort of his brainchild. Okay, well, when it comes to ordinals, like uh, what brought Luxor to the table? Like what what how why did you guys just get you know jump into this head you know head first? I guess. Yeah. So immediate. So most of 2022, we saw that transaction fee volume was very low as a percentage of block reward. Generally, it was less than one percent, which, in my opinion, is a big problem for Bitcoin long term. The idea is that as you know, Bitcoin halvings occur, meaning the amount of Bitcoin emitted goes down by half every four years. Um, basically, the inflation rate decreases by half every four years. We need to replace that subsidy with transaction fee volume, and so seeing in 2022. That we were only, you know, we were at about one percent uh, of the block reward being transaction fees is very concerning for the long-term security of Bitcoin. Um, immediately, when I learned about ordinals and inscriptions, I saw this is a way for natural demand for block space and basically, you know, transaction emission to occur. Uh, immediately, I was like, this is something we need to help foster uh, because this immediately impacts our our customers who are miners. Miners are the ones that benefit when there are more transactions and more transaction fee volume. Uh, they are the ones that are in absorbing that extra uh, that extra revenue. So I wanted to be in and foster that immediately. Also, you know, some of the biggest, you know, or some of the most active projects outside of Bitcoin on other chains are a lot of times NFT projects. And so I was thinking if we can start to bring that type of activity into Bitcoin, uh, that's just another use case for Bitcoin and ultimately will drive value to Bitcoin and ultimately our Bitcoin miners at the end of the day. So that's the reason that we really got into it. And the way that we did that is by we went out and acquired uh, early on. There was a website called ordinalhub.com. Uh, basically, that was a site where you would go and learn about new ordinal projects, you know, uh, you know, when project new art projects that were minting up. Um, we went and acquired Ordinal Hub within the first couple of weeks of Ordinal Mania and have been off to the races ever since, adding infrastructure, adding new features, and just trying to expose more information, more data about this rapidly, rapidly developing ecosystem. Okay. Well, we, we've got about two minutes, so I'm going to throw you a fast one here. Um, so, you know, if more, if, if ordinals and inscriptions are playing a big part in transaction fees and, and miners being, you know, miners obviously liking that, uh, to me, common sense would say that would help, you know, the strength and security of the Bitcoin network per se. And so a lot of Bitcoin maxis are, are upset with the, the ordinal stuff uh, because of, you know, what it's doing at the base layer. But I mean, if, if every Everybody kind of is aware that, you know, most transactions are probably going to take place on a second layer like Lightning anyways and just be settled at a later date. Does it really matter? So, exactly. Like you said, um, there was a lot of concern early on about ordinals and inscriptions uh, potentially causing what we call chain bloat, uh, meaning the blockchain would grow faster over time. Right now, the Bitcoin blockchain is around 500 gigabytes, just, you know, a lot of data, but not terrible you know a, a, a 100 a one terabyte drive or a thousand gigabyte drive is uh maybe a hundred dollars so it's not you know the worst thing um but the concern was that it would start to cause that chain size to grow more quickly than it did before that was one of the big concerns the other was, the other was of course causes transaction fees to go up which reduces the usability you know the ready ready usability of bitcoin um but in my mind these are very small uh concerns and i think at this point they've generally been assuaged uh by you know by the ordinals ecosystem and by the ordinals proponents at large 
Okay, well, that's good. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm still wrapping my head around it all because, uh, you know, when I was at uh, Bitcoin Miami, uh, <laughs> it was, there was some contention from some people that I was talking to. But I, I I'm learning. You know, I just, that's why I'm having you on the show is because I want to learn about this aspect of, of Bitcoin. Um, all right, well, guys, we got to to run to break here in just a minute. But, uh, but Nick, if if people are liking what you have to say uh, and they want to follow you, maybe they want to check out your company, where would they go? Yeah, so of course, our website is luxor.tech. Uh, if you want to go check out Hashrate Index, it's just hashrateindex.com. Uh, ordinalhub.com, you can ping me on Twitter. I'm at hash underscore bender. I'm um, actually hash underscore bender on uh, Telegram as well. Uh, as we all know, crypto runs on Telegram. Um, so yeah, all of those places are way, ways that you can get in touch with me. Um, and yeah, I encourage anybody that you know has any questions to reach out. Happy to answer them. Uh, if you want to go take a look at hash rate index, that's a great place to get started. If you're new to mining or you're seasoned and you understand this stuff really well, there's probably something there uh, that will help you uh, as you make these you know make these decisions and try to figure out how to navigate this new and emerging ecosystem. Love it. I love it. Well, guys, we're going to head to break. I want you to stay put because we're going to have more great conversation with Nick and we're going to continue to dive deeper in this. Uh, hopefully you're learning something. Uh, but uh, hey, we'll be right back and uh, call up a friend. Uh, leave us a comment. Subscribe, like, share. Do it all. We're trying to spread the news of Bitcoin. We'll be right back. If you're the kind of person that likes to drive a lot, and your car is a little older and out of the normal warranty, keep listening. What's going on underneath the hood of your car? If your car is out of warranty, you're at risk of expensive repair bills. Now, for a couple of dollars a day, you can get an extended protection plan for your car. You love your car, so why not give it a little extra care and make sure if something goes wrong, your bank account is safe. Literally, for a couple of dollars a day, you can give yourself peace of mind that you've purchased a top-tier vehicle repair coverage plan. Call the Auto Protection Network right now and ask how you could save an additional $500 on your policy. 800-987-0618 800-987-0618 That's 800-987-0618 Come on. You watch the news, be prepared to pay more taxes. Then if you owe back taxes or haven't filed in a few years, get ready. The IRS, the largest collection agency in the world, will be coming after you. With the power to collect taxes by any means they want to. Hey, they can freeze your bank account, your passport, even padlock your business. Oh, good times. Look, if the IRS claims you owe them 5000 or more in back taxes and they're coming after you, don't panic. Call my friends at Get a Tax Lawyer first. Their job is to negotiate with the IRS and save you money. They're experts at it. That's all they do. And you can trust them. In some cases, they have reduced a $50,000 tax bill to less than $1,000. If you owe the IRS $5,000 or more in back taxes, call now for a free consultation. Call 800-732-9635. 800-732-9635. What does it mean to be physically, spiritually, and financially free? The right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness, these were the ideas that made America. But what happens to these ideas when America's money becomes compromised? What do you do when the very thing that you're working for day after day is fundamentally designed to enslave you? Whether it was a conspiracy or not, you won't believe what is about to happen in this country. Arm yourself today with the truth and build your life on the foundations for liberty. Rediscover freedom in the 21st century and grab a copy of my Amazon best-selling book, Foundations for Liberty. For just $11.99, you can support this radio show by finding a copy on Amazon or by going to mattjmore.com. Again, that's mattjmore.com. Don't wait, because freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. Hello, America. That's right. It's Matthew J. Moore here for round three of, yes, 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 your favorite Bitcoin radio show, America's 
Bitcoin focused radio show. That's cryptocurrency with Matthew J. Moore. And this is round three of this wonderful program. And uh, we've got a wonderful guest and a wonderful topic, like always. Um, I try to bring you the best of the best. And I feel like I'm doing that today. And so, whether you are a newbie to this space, maybe you know a lot about this space, it really doesn't matter because we try to cr create content for everybody so it can be consumed, even by the layman. Uh, but hey, this show, uh, the conversation has been going great. I don't know if you've ever heard of a company called Luxor Technology, but uh, they're shaking up the game. They're doing great things in the Bitcoin space. They're advancing Bitcoin in, in multiple ways. And uh, and I've got their CEO on the line. And, uh, you know, we, this is a shorter segment to the show, so I'm not going to waste a lot of time. And so I want to bring him back to the front of uh, the, the, the conversation here. Uh, Nick, his name is Nick Hansen. Like I said, uh, Nick is the CEO of Luxor Technology. Uh, Nick, welcome back to round three. Are you ready to continue this great conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Well, I, I love the products and services that you, you're providing to the space and uh, and how knowledgeable you are. And, 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 and you know, I, I, I wanted to just kind of get the, the you know, the feel, I mean, how, how does the Bitcoin mining space in general respond to the work that you guys are doing? Oh, I'm sorry. I actually broke up there just a oh. little bit. Would you mind repeating the question? Yeah, not a problem at all. Uh, so with, when it comes to Bitcoin miners, how has the overall response been to your products and services? Are you, are they, are they absolutely eating it up? Yeah, of course. So we, um, yeah, our customers are, are very interested in a lot of things that we're bringing to market just mostly because they're novel. Um, so Bitcoin mining firmware, uh, the, fir the software that goes on the mining machine, uh, there's only really a few options out there. So we're just offering another option, which is very interesting. Also, our, our hedging products, we build financial packages uh, for, for hedging or for getting more leverage or financing your, your mining operation. Uh, that's also rather novel. So a lot of our customers are very excited about the products that we're bringing to market just because of how new and, and innovative they are. And, and you know, that's something that we, we try to pride ourselves on is bringing you know, interesting products that haven't really been developed yet. Uh, and then also refining what exists today. So our mining pool is considered, um, you know, somewhat cutting edge in, in, in that we have a lot of features uh, that other mining pools either don't have or don't have the complete set of features. And so, yes, we do get great feedback from our customers on all of the products that we bring to market, uh, generally because we have that really customer minded focus and, and think a lot about the customers that we bring on uh, and how we can best suit their needs. So if I'm a Bitcoin miner and the Bitcoin having is around the corner in 2024, what should miners be considering the most right now? Yeah, there's really two factors. One is your cost to produce Bitcoin, um, which is basically a function of how efficient your mining machine is and uh, your energy price. So uh, right now, if you're if you're buying Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin price is around twenty nine thousand today. Uh, if your cost to produce a Bitcoin is, say, 15000 you're looking really good. You've got a really good operation going there. There are some miners that are able to get it below $10,000 uh, per Bitcoin, which means their margins are very, very high. And if the halving occurred tomorrow, they would still be profitable. But if you're in that middling range, you know, say it costs you eighteen dollars to $24,000 to mine a Bitcoin, you're in a good position now. You're in a decent position now, but not in a great position for the halving. Um, so you have to think about how do I reduce that number? Do I figure out how to get lower energy pricing? Do I figure out how to get better machines that are more efficient and produce Bitcoin more more uh, efficiently? Um, those are the things that you need to be thinking about as you're as we're coming into the having, and uh, and that's what most of the big miners are thinking about. You'll you'll see most of the big miners right now are turning over old hardware trying to get ready for when the halving occurs. They have the most efficient hardware. They're also really looking hard at their power prices and figuring out, is there a place where I can go and get you know better access to cheaper power? Uh, how do I reduce my power cost? Uh, those, are the, those are the two big factors that people are looking at. Uh, the, most, you know, the most advanced and most um, prepared miners are thinking about. Okay, well, and you know, we're we're going to be coming up on a new bull market here probably pretty soon. Uh, what what uh, what does your business strategy? You know, what, how does that change and evolve in a bear, in bear and bull market cycles? So, Bit, so Luxor is a bear market company. We were founded during a bear market. We started during you know we we kind of got to experience the twenty late twenty seventeen early twenty eighteen bull, uh, and then had to you know live through the the next bear. Uh, and then obviously we have, we're a part of the, the amazing 2021 bear uh, bull market as well. Uh, but we're built to be a bear market company. We need to be able to 
you know, he, here's the way I put it. Whenever I talk to like other lecture employees, investors, etc., Bitcoin is going to change the world. It already has and is going to continue to do so. It's going to be one of the most important technological advancements that's ever occurred uh, in our lifetime. If you're building a business there, you're going to have a fun, it's a phenomenal market to be in. And once we get to that utopian, pro, that utopian world where Bitcoin is ubiquitous and all of our transactions occur on chain, um, it's going to be an amazing place. The thing is, your company has to survive to see that. If you die before you get there, um, you know, it's all for naught. So we build as a bear, we build to be a bear market company. We try to make ourselves very, uh, sustainable, uh, and reliable, uh, based on, you know, we, we, we take, you know, the, the barest of cases. Now, that doesn't mean during a bull market, we have our heads down and we're not thinking about how can we expand. So during a bull market, that's when you try to, you know, you can try new things. You can be experimental. You can maybe take that bet that you couldn't take during the bear market because it was too risky. It could potentially put your business at risk. Uh, and so during the bull market, we're able to take some of those risks and really see what sticks and then be prepared for, you know, for the, the you know, a downturn if there is one uh, to, you know, to really hunker down and be, you know, we call it cockroach mode or, or default alive uh, is another term that we use. But so that's kind of the way that we approach bull and bear uh, is be bear market ready, but then also pounce when the bull market is around. I love it. Well, we've got uh, about two or three minutes before we got to close out the show. But when it uh, when it comes to Bitcoin in general, uh, what's got you most excited today? Right now, it's mostly just the growth of the ecosystem. Every everywhere you look, there's new, interesting, innovative companies being popping up. Whether that's in mining, whether that's in lightning, ordinals and inscriptions came out of nowhere in Q1. Uh, right now, it's just there's the the smartest minds are coming to Bitcoin, coming back to Bitcoin, and being involved and in really thinking about the hard problems facing Bitcoin. And so, a lot of the problems that we've had with Bitcoin coming up to now are going to be solved by these incre incredibly smart people. And that just makes me think that this ecosystem is just going to get even more robust and just become a, you know, what we, what this utopian world that we really think is going to come uh, as a result of all of this incredible innovation. So that's what excites me the most is just seeing, you know, all the smart people that are coming this way. Well, one more time, if somebody liked what you had to say today on today's show, uh, where would they uh, follow your work and check out what you guys are doing? Yeah, so our website is luxor.tech. That's for the mining pool and all the mining related stuff. Hashrateindex.com is a great place for people who are either brand new to mining and trying to learn what this stuff even is, or you're fully experienced. I think that, you know, there's probably something there that could be useful for you in making your decisions. Um, then, of course, we have ordinalhub.com if you're interested in the art and culture of Bitcoin. Uh, if you want to reach out to me personally, I'm at hash underscore bender on Twitter, also at hash underscore bender on telegram uh telegram of course is where crypto runs so uh happy to chat um and I, I do encourage anybody that has any questions to reach out to me either on twitter or telegram uh, and i'm happy to, to to discuss any of the points that we talked about today so uh any closing thoughts uh before we uh close out the show here we got about uh oh gosh maybe a minute or so but um anything we didn't cover that you want to mention no, I think that uh, right now the big thing and, you know, the big thing we're really focused on is just thinking about that having the having's coming down, you know, all of the, you know, all of the mining machines are getting priced it, that that number is getting priced into the mining machines. So we, we're going to see what happens to Bitcoin price here as well. Um, so definitely keep that one, in, keep that big event in mind. It's the biggest event in Bitcoin. It only happens every four years. So uh, that's the thing that we're looking at. And I suggest everybody that is interested in this ecosystem, take a look and, and really kind of look at what that means for uh, for Bitcoin and for all of the companies operating in this space. Well, and real quickly, remind people what that mining reward gets cut to here real shortly. So it's gonna it's six point two five Bitcoin per block right now, and that is going to go down to three point one two five. We're gonna go from about you know a block reward is about one hundred eighty thousand right now. It's gonna go down to just under ninety thousand. That's right. Well, guys, that, it wraps up our show today, and I've enjoyed the conversation, Nick. And uh, yes, the bull market is coming. The halving is coming. Or coming. Bitcoin has already changed the world. It's going to continue to change the world. Stick around. And, and you know what? Same time, same place. I want you guys to come back. We'll see you guys next week. Bitcoin is literally changing the world. Don't get left behind. We'll see you guys next time.